in 1979, a copy of a top-secret government report disappeared on a mail train between London and Birmingham. The report had been drawn up by British Army intelligence in Northern Ireland, and it offered a detailed assessment of the likely trends in provisional IRA activity over the next five years. Paragraph 57 read, the availability of long delay timers makes it feasible for bombs to be placed at a target before suspicion arises. Such a system is very accurate and can produce a delay of weeks or even years. We would expect to see more use of these long delay timers, particularly with a view to causing explosions at sensitive moments such as the time of a VIP visit. Six years later, on the night of October 12, 1984, in the middle of the Tory party conference, the IRA blew up the Grand Hotel in Brighton. Inside were the Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary, and other key members of the British Cabinet. The bomb had been planted four weeks earlier with a long delay timer. And when the dust settled, it left five people dead and 33 injured. For the British government, it was the closest call since Guy Fawkes. In this special report, we tell the story of one provisional bomber, Patrick Joseph McGee, the man who blew up the Grand Hotel. It's a story which offers some grim insights into the world of the provisional IRA, and it contains little of comfort for our hard-pressed security forces. It begins not here in Brighton, but 300 miles away in the Catholic ghettos of Belfast. August 1969. After decades of discrimination, political discontent exploded into civil disorder. On the streets, among the bricks and the petrol bombs, a new organization calling itself the Provisional IRA, a hardline version of the long-established Irish Republican Army. One of its recruits was to be Pat McGee. Pat McGee was born in 1951 in the Ardoin, one of the Catholic enclaves in West Belfast. He moved with his family to Norwich, where he had three convictions for minor offences as a juvenile. By 1969, though, he was back in Belfast, living here in Unity Flats, then one of the breeding grounds for the social discontent which led directly to the troubles of 1969. A priest who spent years in West Belfast is Father Pat Buckley. Uh, I personally would uh, completely disagree with the use of violence. Uh, at the same time, I can understand very fully the, the sense of frustration and the sense of injustice uh, that makes a person feel that they have to resort to the use of the gun. I think there are basically four things uh, that make a paramilitary or a provo. Uh, first of all, there would be the deplorable um, housing conditions that the Roman Catholic community have had to endure. Secondly, there would be the, the huge level of unemployment up to 80% uh, at times. Uh, thirdly, uh, there would be the experience on behalf of many people in Catholic areas of harassment uh, by the security forces. And finally then, there would be the whole situation of lawlessness uh, that young people are born into, where the, the police and the security forces, uh, because they're unacceptable, uh, cannot control various areas. This man, Pat McGeehan, tried with others to blow up the Europa Hotel in Belfast in 1975. He was sentenced to 15 years. At what age did he join the Republican movement? Well, initially, it would probably been around 13, 14. What was the first work that you did for them? It would have involved probably selling papers and sort of generally putting up posters, and doing that type of work. And what age were you when you became involved with bombs and bombing? It uh, would have been around 16, 17. During the early 70s, as the province was engulfed in a virtual civil war, the provisionals embarked on a massive bombing campaign. The cost of disruption, in human terms, was, to them, irrelevant. But they also scored what the security forces came to describe as own goals. Obviously, in the early days, they, were more mis they made more mistakes. They, they had to, because they had, they had no previous experience, they were sending young people out often to plant bombs who hadn't had experience of previous IRA campaigns. You find many of them being blown up. There's apocryphal stories about books. Uh, one was supposed to be by Lady Bird. Uh, uh, bulbs, batteries, and magnets being raided for information on circuitry and so on. You saw the effects of it. 
uh, in, in people being blown up at bomb making classes, blown up, bringing a bomb to a target, putting the wires in the wrong way. It's, it's all there in the IRA rule of honour and indeed many of the people uh, died in this area where we're standing now, where the D company operated. It, it's, the evidence is there. It's fairly obvious. Anyone who knows much about making bombs knows that you don't need to go outside your own area. You don't need to go outside a house for to learn how to make a bomb. It's a fairly straightforward technical sort of subject. But that would have been then at home or in somebody else's home? Obviously, it could have been anywhere. Exactly when Pat McGee learned how to make and plant bombs isn't clear. But in the early 70s, he was certainly a familiar figure in the Lower Falls, one of the frontline Catholic areas of Belfast. Sometimes he was seen in the company of another provisional, a man called Roy Walsh, a name that will figure in this story more than a decade later. By now, it was 1971. The situation in Northern Ireland was critical. The authorities came up with a new answer. It was called internment. Over the next five years, thousands of Catholics were to be arrested and locked away without charge or trial. Many of the internees came here to Long Cash. The British called it the hanky factory, after the inmates' fondness for decorating handkerchiefs. One of the men in the hanky factory was Pat McGee. Fellow internee Joe Clark remembers him well. I first met Pat when he was interned. He was kids three. Uh, he was a popular fellow, very artistic. And uh, if you needed any hankies or uh, tracings done, Pat was the first to give you a hand with them. Uh, he was into the Irish language, Irish culture, and he mostly kept, you know, apart from that, he uh, kept himself to himself. Internment was a mixed blessing for the British. Far from solving the security problem, it actually made it worse. Catholic priests were frequent visitors. What happened with internment was that many of the people uh, who had Republican motivation were actually taken uh, from their homes and neighborhoods and thrown together in cages and compounds uh, in prisons. And therefore, they had the opportunity, if you like, to develop uh, their whole Republican, Republican uh, thinking and strategy. And uh, I think that perhaps also compounded the, the problem. And the problem spread. In March 1973, the Provisionals launched their mainland bombing campaign with